I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana, back town, Girt Town, Zion City. I'm from the Lord Nine, Mr. Dean, where we don't mind dying. The only thing I wanted to do was grow up in New Orleans and go to the NBA and save my family. Everybody thought I was going to go to the NBA like my little buddy Avery Johnson. And I see Avery on TV and I said, go, Avery. That should have been me. No, it shouldn't have, because that wasn't my calling. That wasn't my calling. Many of us are caught up in things that we have not been called to do. Many of us trying to be rappers and shake dancers and this and that when we've been called to be something greater. One night I was playing basketball in the city of New Orleans and I took a long jump shot. One of the few I did a little funky come around the back through the leg. One of the few jump shots I missed. Shirk shade off the rim. Now I went to get the ball but a young man beat me to the ball and he grabbed the ball in my arm and they went that way and I went this way and I suffered a traumatic shoulder separation. My coach picked me up and he took me to the hospital. We got to the hospital and the doctor walked in and he looked and he said, oh no, and he ran back out. And he came back in with three more doctors and all four of the doctors got around me. They took a sheet and they tied me up and they did like a tug of war and popped my shoulder back in. And the doctor said, son, we have two things to tell you. I was like, what? They said, one, you suffered a traumatic shoulder separation, you'll never be able to play basketball again. They said, two, we don't know how long it'll take for your shoulder to heal. My coach picked me up and he took me home. He said, I'm sorry, son. The dreams are destroyed. And he got to my house and he knocked on the door. Knock, knock, knock. My mom answered the door. He said, Mrs. Macri, I'm sorry to tell you, but your son has separated his shoulder and he'll never be able to play basketball again. My mom looked at me and she only had one thing to say. She said, what are you going to do now? We told you to study. We told you to study. I said, Mama, what about my shoulder? She said, shut up and get in this house. I said, Mama, we need more like that. I went in my bedroom. I laid in the bed and I was wondering what I was going to do, Darren. I looked up. I said, God, what am I going to do? And God said, boy, don't worry about your shoulder because you're going to do more for this world with your head than you ever thought you'd do with your legs and your arms. I got up the next day and I went to school to find my favorite teacher, Miss V. When I walked in, I said, Miss V, my shoulder. She said, shut up, Calvin. We heard about your shoulder. She said, but what are you going to do now? We told you to study. We told you to study. I said, I don't know, Miss V. I said, I think I'm going to be an engineer. She said, who? You? See, Nesby, sometimes it's the people closest to us who really doesn't believe in our dreams. It's the person that's sitting right next to us, the person in the suit, our boy on our team, who doesn't believe that we can dream what God has put in our heart. So I'm from the lower nine. She doesn't believe that people like us, or people like me, can dream to aspire to something so great. She said, who? You, Kelvin? She said, do you know what an engineer does? I said, no, but it sounds real good. She said, well, look, if you're going to be an engineer, you have to go take this test. I said, what test? She said, the SAT. Now, people, I was ignorant. You don't get bent out of shape when people call you ignorant. Ignorant means you just don't know. Stupid means there's no hope for you. <laughs> Too many of us acting stupid. <laughs> I was just ignorant because I grew up in a house with no My father dropped out of school in eighth grade to pick cotton. My mother went to a state-approved Negro high school. I was so ignorant when she told me to go take the SAT, I thought SAT meant Saturday. And then I knew it meant Saturday because she told me the test was on Saturday. <laughs> so that Friday, I took my little girlfriend to the game to support our team. Then after the game, we went to a little dance to get our boogie on. And I took her home and I got up on Saturday morning to go take my Saturday test. When all the kids like you had shown up, who had done what they were supposed to have done, they were all nervous and biting their nails. I put my head on the table. They had to wake me up. They said, young man, wake up. They gave me that test and I was so ignorant. I didn't know that word, it's to that word, it's to that word. I didn't know any of those words. So Nesby, you know what we do when we don't know what we don't, we don't know what we're supposed to know. I start going A, B, C, D, D, C, B, A, A, B, C, D. I said, whoa, I better change this thing up. C, B, C, B, A, D. <laughs> I looked around, I was the first one finished. I was like, bunch of dummies. <laughs> I put my head back on the table. They had to wake me up. They said, young man, go home. I went home. That's when we had to weigh down our scores, Darrell. Six weeks later, I went to the mailbox, and I ripped it open. I saw the scores, and I pulled them out, and I ripped them open. And I looked at them. I said, oh, yeah. And I went to school, and I found Miss V. When I walked in, Miss V said, Kelvin, you got him. I said, Miss V, I got him. She said, Kelvin, how did you do? Ignorantly and confident, I looked at her and said, I got 84%. She said, you got 84% on the SAT? That's unbelievable, Kelvin, especially for you. She said, but Kelvin, I never heard the test explained in percentages before. <laughs> she, <laughs> she said, Kelvin, what's your raw score, your total score? Ignorantly and confidently, I looked in her eyes and I screamed, 840. 
She was shaking her head. She said, no, son, you got some issues. She said, Calvin, the test is not out of 1,000. The test is out of 1,600. You don't have 84%. You barely have 50%. That's not good, Calvin. You have to go take that test again. I said, oh, no, not that Saturday test. I'll stick with my Friday test. I do much better on Friday. <laughs> she, 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 she said, well, look, if you're going to be an engineer, you have to go to college. I said, bet. She said, there's a college recruitment at the New Orleans Superdome on Saturday. Saturday, I went down to that Superdome. I kicked the door open. I walked in. The first table I saw, Dr. May, was the Georgia Tech engineers. I'm like, God, this is a divine intervention. I want to be an engineer. The first table I see the Georgia Tech engineer. I go over to the Georgia Tech table. And the guy sitting there said, what can I do for you, son? I said, sir, I'd like to be an engineer. He said, you came to the right place. We the rambling wreck from Georgia Tech and heck of an engineer. I said, yeah. He said, uh, son, what's your SAT score? Ignorantly and confidently, I looked at him. I screamed, 840. He was shaking his head. He wouldn't even give me an application. He's like, <laughs> he like, boy, you can't come down to school with no 840 SAT. I never even heard anything like that. <laughs> See, Nesby, we have to realize just because a school is ranked number one, that doesn't mean it's number one for you. Wherever you are, whatever school you're in, I don't care whatever the ranking, you can leave there and go around the world. I'm closing it out. The greatest thing the man at, at Georgia Tech did for me, he said, we can't do anything for you. But he just happened to point out an HBCU by the name of Morehouse College. He said, go over there. They may be able to help you. And I went over to Morehouse College, wounded. And I said, bro, that man over there sent me over here. The guy at said, what can I do for you, son? He said, I, I said, I'd like to be an engineer. He said, you came to the right place. He said, son, what's your SAT score? I said, uh, can we talk about this one? <laughs> <laughs> I whispered, I said, hey, boy, he was shaking his head. <laughs> he said, I tell you what, son, you're a diamond in a rough, but a diamond show enough. Sign right here and come to Morehouse. We'll make you into a doctor. We'll make you into a lawyer. We'll make you into an engineer in June 1985. My mom took me to Morehouse College. Now, people, I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana, back in town, Girt Town, Zion City. I'm from the Lord Nine, where we don't mind dying. We talk funny in New Orleans, and we don't even know it. You can be honest with me. In the aftermath of Katrina, you was watching television going, what language is this? What country? What are they saying? <laughs> we talk funny. When I got the mouse, everybody laughed at the way I talked because I was saying things like, I'm bout it, bout it. How you do that there? I'm the man right here. You heard me, little Wody's off the easy for sheezy up in here, cousin. <laughs> Just like you, they didn't know what I was saying. They said, see spot run? I said, no. They said, right. Don't pass go. Go directly to remedial reading. <laughs> they said, boy, you reading on about an eighth grade level. <laughs> and can you imagine the pain and indignation I felt every day? when he used to make me go down to the basement of a building called Wheeler Hall at 18 years old with middle schoolers, when kids like you was going to world lit and English count because you had done what you were supposed to have done. And every day I had to sit before a computer and they would let the words go by faster and faster and faster until I was able to read at the place where I was supposed to be reading. My friends called us LD for Louisiana dummies. Benjamin Lodge May says that when you find out that you're behind in a race of life, you have two choices, run faster or quit. My friends laughed and they laughed and they laughed, and I ran and I ran and I ran. After starting more, I was remedial reading, 0.0, .0 credit. I finished more, I was for three and a half years, number one in mathematics, number five in the largest class that Morris had ever produced, magnum cum laude, Phi Beta Kappa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nesby, don't get it twisted. Don't get it twisted. It's not about me, it's about the greatness in you. They came up to me and they said, Calvin, when your father dropped out of school in eighth grade to pick cotton, your mother went to the state approved Negro High School. When you came in remedial reading, who would ever thought that you've done the things that you have done now? They said, Calvin, what are you going to do now? I said, I'm going to Georgia Tech. It's only a mile and a half away and a dollar fifty bus ride. Two weeks later, January 1989, I started Georgia Tech. 18 months later, I finished my second undergraduate degree, a BS in mechanical engineering. Two degrees in five years to the inner city ghetto kid from back in town, Girt Town, Zion City of New Orleans, who they said never should have been college in the first place. Two years later, in 1992, I got a master's in mechanical engineering. Three degrees in seven years. Exxon, Mobile Oil, Chevron came down trying to give me job interviews. Chevron gave me job interviews in Bakersfield, California, Texas, El Paso, Beaumont, Texas, and Pascagoula, Mississippi. Chevron then came around because they really wanted me and gave me a job interview in New Orleans, Louisiana, my home. It took me to 15, 15 Parger Street to a high rise building overlooking the Superdome. It took me to the top of the building, gave me a suite overlooking the Superdome that 24 years old gave me a check for $50,000. It took me to the roof, put me in a helicopter. It flew me out over my house, took me to an oil rig, put me in an airplane, brought me back in, put me in a limo, took me all the way back to the building, brought me up to the top and said, Calvin, you down with us? 
I said, you all don't understand. When I was 12 years old, I put doctor on my door. I thought I was going to be Dr. J. <laughs> but that didn't work out. So I heard Georgia Tech has something else left in there. And they had people like Dr. May there to make sure that people like me was able to do the things that we wanted to do. <laughs> Dr. May said, we're committed to you, Kelvin. We're committed to your kind. We believe in you. Georgia Tech said, come on, Kelvin. And four years later, in 1996, I became one of 11 African Americans in the country that year to receive the PhD in mechanical engineering. Nesby, I, don't, I didn't come this far to brag. I didn't come this far to brag. I came this far to tell you that story, to let you know that every one of us have been impregnated with something so great, such that if we give birth to it, it'll make Bill Gates look like a midget in the annals of history. But yet and still, too many of us have committed to having abortions on our dreams. Question is, what's your dream? Because Nesby is the dream maker place. This is it. What is your dream? We need you to go back when you leave in, go back to your hotel room and wake up that clown and wake up that sucker that's sleeping and say, only thing that comes to a sleeper is a dream. Wake him up. You need to go back and wake him up. 